following a, uh, a, a familiar theme from the first talk um, by Owen, I'm going to talk about uh, improvement in cognitive performance after a surgical decompression for a Chiari malformation type 1. It's a prospective study at the University of Iowa. And I will say this is a uh, largely collaborative effort here um, by many different people um, to do this. And um, I'm sure it was done at, uh, at, uh, um, at Brown and what Owen talked about. It, it takes an effort to be able to, 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 to do this in all these patients. Um, oh, next slide. So no disclosures. I just have funding internally here um, and from NIH, and this is uh, unrelated uh, to the topic at hand. Next slide. So uh, overview of the Chiari malformation. We all know this, but um, just to um, put things in perspective here for this talk, you know, tonsortosin we know uh, results in obstruction of CSF flow through the fourth ventricle and across the cervical medullary junction. Um, I guess, um, this can result in brainstem compression um, and syringomyelia. Uh, this can lead to valsalva-induced headaches and symptoms of brainstem dysfunction, cellular dysfunction, syringomyelia, scoliosis, and a whole host of other types of symptoms. Um, below, I just show you kind of what you typically see uh, in a healthy control um, in the cerebellum um, that looks not under pressure or not compressed in any kind of way. Um, and the brainstem is, is, um, seems open and clear and the cervical metric junction and the CSF flow seems to flow, would flow nor normally through that without a problem. And on the left, you see two Chiari malformations. One I just label as asymptomatic Chiari and one I label as a symptomatic Chiari malformation. And here you can see, I think, a, a significant difference, especially the one on the right where you have this uh, uh, very, very compressed um, cerebellum, but it seems you see, the, it seems you lack the, the uh, the folia, the typical folia you would typically see in the cerebellum, um, what, what we describe as a kind of a larger fourth ventricle and a, and a bowed fourth ventricle uh, compared to what you see um, typically in a, in, in a healthy control um, or even asymptomatic Chiari malformation. Um, and you know, what seems to be something that's definitely under pressure and uh, obstructing uh, flow of thru, uh, fluid from out of the fourth ventricle and across the cervical medullary junction. You can imagine there'd be a whole host of symptoms from this. Um, including, uh, next slide, uh, what you would think of uh, also what the cerebellum also does, which plays a role in, in cognition and cognitive performance. Um, and this is something that's been, been studied a lot by Jeremy Schmaman at, uh, at Harvard. And really his pioneering work is kind of what's led um, us down, down this road. Um, so we know that Chiari patients, they have these subtle cognitive symptoms. I think everyone um, that treats KRA patients knows this, um, but these are really underreported, underinvestigated. I don't think we totally know what to do with what, what to do with these. Are they really from the from the cerebellum? Um, is it from de depression? Is it from pain? What what is it? It's it's hard to understand. Um, but we do know that the cerebellum has efferent afferent pathways that go through the brainstem and then play this really critical role in cognition. And again, this is a lot of this has been. Um, done by Jeremy Schmaman and others now. Um, there's really this emerging evidence to suggest that the cerebellum plays a significant role. I think us as pediatric uh, neurosurgeons, um, we, we see this often with, with the posterior fossa syndrome, um, where you know almost you see multiple different domains and cognition is affected after taking out a midline um, cerebellar um, tumor. And prior work has really suggested that the Chiari malformation um, patients, they have deficits in visual, spatial, and, and cognitive function um, by study by Allen. Um, that was mentioned even in the first um, talk. Um, there's been no large comprehensive prospective study of cognitive performance and Chiari malformation to date, and really no prospective study examining how surgical decompression affects cognitive performance. Just on the right there, I just showed two um, uh, examples of AFER and EFER and pathways. Um, and, and how they go through the brainstem, which we know is affected by Chiari malformation, um, as well as through the cerebellum, which we also know is um, clearly affected with tonsor descent uh, in, in patients with Chiari. Next slide. So this is our prospective study design, funny enough, it's very, very similar to, what, to what's been, uh, done elsewhere. So um, really this is the, the study of the cognitive performance of these patients, uh, the effects of surgical decompression um, they have this initial clinic evaluation um, and determine whether someone has an operative or surgical Chiari malformation. Um, 
they then return for their pre-op workup screening and then consent. And on that day, the day before surgery, they undergo neuropsychological, um, uh, go to our neuropsych neuropsychological clinic for testing. Um, then they have surgery. Then they have this period of recovery and routine follow-up. And then we test them 12 months later. Um, and we test them that far out, so they're out of the realm of um, anesthesia, um, uh, pain medications, um, and to avoid this kind of test, retest, um, uh, uh, confound. And so um, with all of the, th this, this kind of study, there's going to be, in almost every KRE study, there's going to be a selection bias, right? These are the patients that we de determined who are symptomatic um, based on the, um, uh, what we felt was our inclusion criteria. Next slide. So uh, this is the inclusion criteria. So this is an ongoing study. Um, so gra greater than um, three years of age, referred to the University of Iowa Neurosurgery Clinic for Chiari malformation um, and tonsil stent greater than five millimeters, um, evidence of a symptomatic Chiari malformation. Um, and that's our criteria, but it's, it's very strict. Uh, valsalva induced occipital headache and neck pain, um, brainstem dysfunction, signs and symptoms. Um, so swallowing dysfunction, loss of a gag response on objective physical exam, ataxia, Romberg's way on objective physical exam, ultrafacial sensation, sleep apnea, nystagmus, stringomyelia, or, or, or progressive scoliosis. Uh, next slide. All these patients were um, surgically treated um, uh, by myself um, and uh, our own menesis, uh, a colleague of mine here. And we had the exclusion criteria. So this is the one thing that we thought about um, who we're gonna exclude. So anyone with mental retardation, dyslexia, Lorraine disorder, IQ less than 70. Anyone that's really on a chronic use of um, opioids, anti-seizure meds or benzos, um, any kind of prior neurological disease of dementia, Parkinson's, Huntington, seizure disorders, um, and then prior history, any kind of neurological, neurosurgical um, intervention. Um, history of traumatic brain injury and hydrocephalus. So no patients in care of hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus were included in this. We specifically want to examine the effect of the cerebellum. Next slide. So obviously these patients underwent neuro neuropsychological evaluation. Next slide. Um, and what what we did was look at these different domains, right? So um, this is the attention of spatial memory, verbal processing speed and executive function um, domains uh, for cognition and, neuro, and neuropsych, neuropsychological evaluation. And they um, all have different tests in which you can use to study these. Um, and so we basically uh, did all of these different tests. Next slide. All right, and so also the type of surgery that you do will vary. And so in, in various from institution to institution, exactly how, what they do, I explained what, what we do. And this is obviously a limitation too of how this is done and it's because it can vary from institution to institution. So preoperative, we have a Chiari malformation there on the left. These patients, they're symptomatic, undergo surgery, they have a neuropsych evaluation. During the surgery, they undergo an extra drill decompression, which you can see there in the middle. And throughout the different steps um, of this, you see the intraoperative ultrasound. We go through the different steps of uh, the bony decompression, uh, ultrasound, um, removal of the, uh, the um, occipital cervical membrane, ligament, um, then ultrasound, and, and so on. External neurotomy and ultrasound to determine whether it was an adequate decompression or not. Um, and then if, if it is, then we just we do an extradural decompression only. Um, and if it's not felt to be good enough, then we do an extradural plus intradural decompression and duroplasty. Next slide. And so this is an example, right? Extradural decompression for Chiari malformation there on the left, preoperative, extradural, and then postoperative. Um, and it's amazing how well some of these extradural decompressions can do, um, and especially when you really thin out the dura uh, with doing an external durotomy. Um, and I mean, you almost would think that this would be an, um, an intradural type of procedure, but, um, but, but they can work very, very well in, in some patients. So uh, next slide. Um, so, and then the other um, a component of surgery is the extradural plus intradural decompression and duroplasty. And what we do is, um, and, and for, these are for patients that are not adequately decompressed um, on ultrasound during surgery, as well as typically a lot of patients that we typically do this in are also patients with syrinx. Um, and uh, we've shown previously that a lot of these patients, all patients with KRA have intradural pathology. Um, their adhesions, um, scarring. This is a, a scarring over the um, fourth ventricle. There's a little video you can play, Caitlin, if you want. This is a veil that, that is um, um, over the uh, frame of Magindi um, and the outlet obstructing CSF flow. When we open this up, you can see CSF that, CSF that typically flows. 
And we typically do bipolar, um, very low power P arachnoid coagulation of the tonsils to reduce them. Um, and we do a cervical fascia duroplasty of the patient's own autologous um, cervical fascia. Um, and, and then we, we close in multi-layer fashion. Many of these patients will have um, arteries that um, and, and, and um, they're abnormal and, and compressed and so forth. And so and the gliosis of the tonsils and the cerebellum. So you can easily imagine that they would have some cerebellar deficits. Um, next slide. Um, and so there's example right of an uh, intraoral decompression with our cervical kind of fascia graft. Next slide. So a data analysis that so we did neuropsych data test data was calculating disease scores for comparison to so norm normalized data. This accounts for age and education. Um, and so we didn't have a control group. Um, uh, we did consider that though. Um, is there, so we had comparisons of performance between preoperative testing and follow-up testing. So each subject's completion of tasks at both time points was confirmed and if assessment at a given time point was not completed then that subject data was excluded. Um, we did uh, multivariate statistical analysis. We had a mean change across all test measures for Wilcox and match pair sign testing. We adjusted for mood and depressive uh, symptoms using the Beck's anxiety um, uh, inventory and uh, Beck's um, uh, mood, mood inventory, uh, depression inventory. Next slide. So demographics included, in total, we've studied, well, total now we've enrolled um, uh, 42 patients. Um, and for this analysis, we did, we took 36 patients that have undergone um, pre-op testing of those so, so far, 25 patients then have had their post-op testing. Um, we did from kids and adults, um, as we typically see um, across all ages here. Um, and um, next slide. And then the clinical presentation of these patients, um, I thought it was important to show this. So mean tonsil descent, both of all our patients that we've tested, as well as the patients that have been tested, um, um, before and after surgery is very similar. So 14 millimeters tonsil descent. And they all, all of them, many of them had uh, balsalva induced headaches. All of them, in fact, um, swallowing dysfunction and had multiple different brain stem symptoms, including swallowing dysfunction, ultrafacial dis uh, sensation, and so on. Uh, next slide. So the clinical outcomes. So, so far in the 34 surgical patients, um, the median follow-up has been 12 months. Range has been six to 42 months. Balsalva induced headaches are resolved in all. Um, the 15 was uh, C-Rank score resolve, AIDS improved, two remain the same, as well as pending imaging studies. And brain stem symptoms and signs have improved in 18 of the 22 cases, the so swelling dysfunction, and so on. There's really no cases of clinical worsening. I think, and most importantly, um, there's been no complications. So um, our definition of complications, no aseptic meningitis, no readmission for any cause after surgery, no hydrocephalus, no need for VP shunt for any reason. Um, no infection, meningitis, um, and no cranial cervical instability. Um, and uh, um, I think that's on, on par sort of with um, what we've had before of our complication rate probably being somewhere between for any of those complications around two or 4% based on whether it's um, pediatric or adult. Um, next slide. So um, this is the, uh, the preoperative baseline cognitive performance. Um, this is across all, all 36 um, patients uh, so far that we've analyzed in data. Um, you can see that this, the, these are all the neuropsychological tests. Disease score there um, is showing what's average and what's below average. A lot of these patients on average are below average. Uh, significantly with the copy figure test recall, um, recall um, the group peg um, board tests, um, trails um, uh, making tests, um, and so forth. Um, there's only a couple, obviously, that are really even close to even over, over the um, average um, line for the Z-score for, for their age group. Uh, next slide. And so what we found was that there was a significant performance in cognition uh, postoperatively after decompression, both inter, either extradural or intradural. Um, and this is approximately one year after um, uh, surgery. Almost, you see a significant number. O only about um, six or seven uh, of these tests that the patients actually decreased on, and there's really no change. But there's a significant improvement. Next slide. Across multiple domains. Um, so, so really, in conclusion, these patients perform worse pre-surgically than normalized data in several neuropsychological tests and, and cognitive domains. Um, these are particularly in these areas of attention, processing speed, and visual spatial memory. Um, with really you know, some improvement in, this, in the copy figure test, test recall. And this is independent of mood or, or motor performance. Next slide. 
So really the future work, this is about to be submitted. We're continuing our su uh, study subjects, three years old. That's our, that's our age group from three to 70. We expect to enroll three patients a year. Um, and we're going to be doing functional imaging in conjunction with neuropsych testing. Really want to better understand the mechanism underlying cognitive performance improvement after posterior fossa decompression. And really looking maybe uh, toward the NIH for, for funding this work. Next slide. Um, so th this is um, would be impossible without Dan Trinnell. Um, for those uh, for those may maybe do know, Dan Trinnell is a um, you know um, a huge huge leader um, in cognitive neuroscience and, and neuropsychology. He's been at the University of Iowa for for decades. Um, and you know without his kind of generous um, uh, offering uh, for his lab uh, to study these patients so um, uh, so significantly. I mean, in such detail, this, this would never have been done. Um, so, and then and Scott Seaman, um, really, he led this. He's a, neuro, a neurosurgery resident at the University of Iowa doing his research years now. Really, he's led this project over the last couple of years since he came in, um, as well as um, Kenneth Manzel, who works in Dan's lab, as well as Carolina Strees, who's a, um, also a graduate student working in Dan's lab, who also played an integral role in testing these uh, subjects and trying to keep the same examiners before, even after, before um, uh, surgery, even after surgery as well as then to Amanda Graff, Alyssa Sullivan, and Aaron Bose um, as our pediatric um, cohort and colleagues. Aaron Bose is a pediatric neurologist I work closely with as an extreme interest in understanding um, cerebellum and cognition, as well as Alyssa Sullivan, who's a grad student as well that's working with me and Dan's lab as well um, in a kind of co-mentor um, type project, and Amanda Graff, who's a, a pediatric clinical neuropsychologist. Next slide. I want to thank off my wife and our, our beautiful, just uh, a born baby boy, Aiden, who's uh, just turned four months uh, of age. Next slide. And, and this obviously wouldn't have been done without our patients. There's IRB approved. Um, all these patients had to go th through consent um, and uh, uh, to undergo the testing, which, which did take some time out of their day. Um, this wasn't this, uh, so before and after, after surgery. So thank you to them. That's it. Okay. Oh, there was a question that came up. Uh, were you able to take into account improvement related to already being familiar with the neuropsych exam from the pre-op test? Yeah. So, so that that re, the test retest um, confound is always there, but that's why spacing it out to testing someone out to a year kind of eliminates that um, uh, that component. Um, and I think if there are no other questions, I'm going to question. move ahead. Oh, oh hey, go ahead. Brian, uh, did the patients hey. improve to normal? This is John Heiss. Uh, oh, where they yeah. were abnormal? I mean, did they improved, but the, did they improve to normal? Um, uh, in some domains, they did, and some they didn't. I didn't show that data, but um, next time. I was, you know, 15 minutes, so I'm just trying to. And did the, <laughs> did the neuropsychologists, do they have coping uh, skills for the people who didn't improve to normal? I mean. Yeah. Um, so, John, I, I was um, I was sort of shocked by the whole, whole uh, <laughs> my, my, the higher, high, our hypothesis, my hypothesis was not that there would be a, I, I didn't think that this would be that significant of um, deficits. Um, interesting enough, I studied this, but I was kind of, Thinking to be challenging. I mean, Dr. Dan Trinnell thought so too. I mean, it, it, um, people study the cerebellum with these, you know, neuropsychological neuropsychological tests for a long time, and it's hard sometimes to, to pull out these these effects. Um, so, um, you know, I think we are rethinking this significantly in terms of, yeah, what what, what are we going to be our next steps? This was completely research um, in terms of, you know, we we didn't really use it from a clinical standpoint to guide them from coping mechanisms going forward. Um, we also, I did not expect to see an improvement um, surgically. I'm a very skeptical person of, of our, my own results, but um, I, I do believe the data at this point um, uh, because it, we try to control for every single variable possible. And we, uh, and, and Dan Trinnell's lab is, does, does an excellent job. Um, but um, yeah, I think we'll have to keep thinking about this a little bit more in terms of what, how, we, how we talk to patients um, and, 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 you know. Thank you.